Hello, it's Tuesday, March 15th, 2016. Uh, welcome to Citizens Forum. First part of Citizens Forum is always the Walt and Jack show, so we'll start off. Um, the first thing I wanted to say is that uh, one of our, one of the members of this group and who's also a, a guest on the show often, Norm Ryder, he's been on several times talking about WorkSafe BC. Uh, yesterday morning on Monday he began a hunger strike on the front steps basically of the BC legislature. Not only, not only no food but also no water. So by the time this airs uh, on Saturday, it'll largely be over because you can't go very long without water. Um, and Norm has always felt that his, uh, his case uh, before WorkSafe BC never got a fair or honest hearing, and, and that's what he is basically putting himself at risk to try to get. So he's on the front steps of the legislature, and next week we'll tell you what happened. Yeah, and, and I think Norm has reasons to uh, to be protesting how he's being treated by WorkSafe BC. I'm a, I'm an employee, or Jack. I've uh, you know employed people in British Columbia since 1985, and I've paid uh, into these uh, these funds to protect workers' health. If you're injured, you should be protected. And uh, if you look at the record of WorkSafe BC in British Columbia particularly for a type of injuries that Norm is talking about, because he was harmed by electromagnetic radiation. And uh, WorkSafe BC, it appears, uh, refused to acknowledge that this type of radiation is harmful, even though there's a, a huge body of evidence uh, worldwide over decades that show that exposure to uh, microwave radiation can cause some very, very serious health effects. So uh, Norm is, I think, uh, doing a very brave thing and trying to bring to the public's attention uh, this issue, and uh, I really wish him well. Yeah, me too. Um, so the next topic is? Well, I came in with a few things. I mean, I, I, I came in with, uh, with uh, Donald Trump again today. We should talk a little bit about the, the American politics because it was trying today to... Today is a vote in several states. Yeah, there's a vote in several states, and, and they're always putting Bernie uh, Sanders well behind. But if, what, if you actually look at the numbers, especially when you remove the pledged delegates, the D Democrats have about 20% uh, of the delegates are called superdelegates, which are basically party officials, uh, much similar to what the NDP did here in B.C. for years and years with the union. They, they carved out a chunk out of their membership and said, okay, uh, the unions have have this uh, this percentage of the vote and, and uh, in, in, in the Democratic Party they have a similar setup but if you remove those super delegates those pledged delegates uh, Bernie Sanders isn't that far behind Hillary Clinton and if the thing is to remember is in every race you'll start out with Hillary ahead maybe 20 or 25 po points and as the day approaches Bernie gets it within four or five points and sometimes wins so Bernie Sanders has the momentum uh, in every way, and it's, thank, thank me for the internet and for that type of media because that's the only way he's been able to communicate. And he's got great ideas. Oh, it's fantastic ideas. Everything he says makes so much sense. He's a huge breath of fresh air and, and Hillary's trying to ride him out. And the point I was going to make today was is I think Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are in bed together. <laughs> I think those, those, those two are combining to defeat um, Bernie Sanders, and I think uh, Hillary is very, very happy to watch Donald, Donald Trump and his antics and, uh, and all the ridiculous things he's saying and doing because he over suppresses Bernie's message. The corporate media is not telling us what Bernie's saying. Bernie's talking about free tuition and universal health care and, and, and tearing apart the big uh, Wall Street banks and, and getting out of uh, terrible, unjust foreign wars. and. Uh, but, you know, actually, Donald Trump says a lot of those same things. You know, in terms of those issues, Trump and Sanders, I don't think, are that far apart. Except Donald Trump has no substance whatsoever. He has no, no analysis whatsoever. He, he, he basically has nothing to yeah, offer. And, and his, his message is so much more divisive, while Bernie's message is, really, we're in this together. Let's yeah. retake control of our country from the the one. Well, Bernie's been 1%. at it for the last thirty to thirty-five yeah. years in Congress. I mean, he's he's been working at it, yeah. and he's been calling himself a socialist. And uh, a lot of people are shocked by that. But I really think that 
what's the really the big picture here the big game is this is that the large corporate interests would very happily have Hillary Clinton they're backing her hundred uh, percent this business as usual with Hillary Clinton she's never saw a war she didn't love she she basically has nothing to say about the Wall Street banks uh, there's nothing being said about the inequities and injustices in American society and in law enforcement and all that Hillary is just is your business as usual candidate and I, I really think that she's happy to see Donald Trump uh, take uh, uh, take this message and not allow Bernie's message to get out. Yeah, and to me, that's the role of the of the media in in this election so far is to focus on so much time and effort on Donald Trump, uh, especially about the divisive. They don't talk about what I would consider his good ideas. For example, he's he's not a free trader. He believes in, he doesn't believe in NAFTA. <coughs> he doesn't believe in the TPP. He's popular because he's talking about bringing jobs back to the United States, which you know I agree with. Yeah, if you could ever implement any of that, if, yeah. it, if it ever could make any sense. So the media out of any should be talking about Bernie Sanders, but well, but not. Donald Trump's not going after the institutional problems with with Wall Street. Wall Street controls all the money in the United States. They also are the people that sit on the Committee for Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. These are the people that decide on what wars the United States is going to get involved in. We're talking about this this cabal of a very small group of people that control American foreign policy that you know I could go on and on about it the, 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 the all these structural things are not going to change uh, under uh, particularly Donald Trump but including Hillary Clinton nothing's going to happen here folks the only candidate that's really offering any real chance for change is is Bernie Sanders and he's up against it because I really think Hillary and Trump are, have more uh, uh, in common than they have uh, not in, in winning this next election. Yeah. Um, you know, and I th think you put your finger on exactly the real problem because what we always talk about are the symptoms. We talk about homelessness, we talk about poverty, we talk about environmental disaster. Those are the symptoms, but the real problem is exactly this cabal that rules not only the United States but it certainly rules Canada as well and taking that the power away from that cabal and bringing it back into the hands of the Canadian people is to me the fundamental important issue of the day because right. if we can't do it it seems like they're quite happy to kill us all one way or another I mean with environmental we're on the edge. We're over the edge of environmental disaster, yeah. and possibly economic disaster as well. And it, it's all been engineered to move all the wealth to them, and they don't care about the rest of us. Well, it's, wealth is is a ramification of, of control, and to me, that's the bottom line. Like the world is the world is full of wealth. There, an opportunity. Uh, there's no reason why we all shouldn't have a safe place to sleep, and food to eat, and, and an education, and and all and health care and all these things. There's no reason why we can't have that, other than the fact that we've bought into this economic model that Wall Street and the other large banks are promoting. That there's some kind of shortage. Well, they, they create the shortage, they create the unemployment. I mean, if you look at uh, like what's happening in Alberta and 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 you know all the workers in Alberta that were working in the oil patch and now are so many of them are stuck and they don't have an income and you really feel terrible about that but who set that, that economic policy why is it they only focused on oil oil production in Alberta I mean I was in Alberta for 10 years working in the oil patch they refused to diversify that economy they could easily have done that it is it's not a mistake that they're that they're uh, this huge unemployment it's just a matter of it's directed towards keeping us poor, keeping us working scared, you know, uh, and all the rest. We, we, we just don't have to buy into that paradigm. And I think, you know, if we just take fundamental basic steps towards developing a real economy uh, through diversification of our, say, of our energy sector and looking at all the renewables and all the things we can do in the, in the energy sector, which would create a boom 
of, 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 of jobs and opportunities in Canada. There's no shortage of that. If, if we all we have to do is shake off the yoke of this corporate mantra that somehow there's this huge shortages and, and a, particularly shaking off the yoke of the, of the petroleum industry. We don't need them anymore. We can move on from that. Yeah, yeah. Walt, I, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I, I think what's needed in, in Canada and the United States as well, maybe we're seeing it in the United States with Bernie Sanders, but in Canada we need, I mean, I, I can't think of one group that's sort of focused on, on that issue that the, you know, I mean, I'll paraphrase what, what you said, but that the enemy is kind of the corporation. We've got to focus on that while the corporation, which owns the media and a lot of the politicians, they're putting huge amounts of money into dividing us. Exactly. So the story I, I've seen a few times now, the rest of Canada is laughing at Alberta. I saw that story today. That, that's what they're telling. They're pitting us against each other. And on CFAX, within the last few days, they had somebody on who's saying, you know how much the federal government gives in money towards older people, but so little towards young people. You know, I've seen them try to divide us on, in every way possible, yeah. and certainly what the media is doing in terms of focusing anger and fear and hate towards the Muslim community is really, really an ugly thing for them to be yeah. doing. And I hope, I really hope that many, many, many Canadians will not fall for it. The story we're being told about the entire Middle East and Muslim situation for the last 20 years is all, it's misinformation. It's to divide us and keep us apart. As you say, Walt, we can be moving towards so much better things in so many ways and instead there's war and poverty and homelessness and sickness. Yeah, it's, it's twisted what, the, what our rulers are doing to us. I, I think, I mean, of course, with Trudeau, and there's going to be so many limitations of what the Trudeau government can do, but at least there's that hope and optimism that we can make some changes. And, you know, I think we, firstly, Canadians have that grasp onto that, that we have optimism. We can do things in our country. We can, we can make positive change. And we just have to not buy into this helplessness and, and uh, this gloom and doom that we're seeing every day in the media, because that plays against us. We're our own worst enemies in many ways. Yeah, and I can't, I don't know what, what the first, well, I know one thing I'd like to do. If, uh, to create not one, but a series of what's called citizens' assemblies. And a citizens' assembly is just a group of people um, who are brought together, maybe 15 to 25, or, or in some cases, dozens of people brought together and given a, a problem to solve. And, and for example, the problem could be, how do we improve democracy in Canada? And you bring citizens who are picked at random. So it really is a reflection of what the citizenry of Canada think. And, and let them even choose their own issue that they want to deal with. Or, you know, how do we improve our democracy? I think the ideas that would come out of that would be absolutely brilliant. It would be riveting. It would let this country start to move towards, I mean, there's so many great people in this country and we're all so oppressed by, not, not all, but so many are oppressed uh, at work and, and then by their government now and, and by the media and by a lack of money, you know, it's, and we don't have to be that kind of country. We can be a country where we have a lot more equality in, which I would like to see. And just when you have more income equality, it has such a positive impact on the entire society in every way, shape, or form. It's amazing uh, to, when you come to realize it. For sure. Yeah. Um, do you want to go on to the thing about uh, distracted driving? Well, yeah. You, you just well, told me this is Distracted Driving Month, which I missed. That's right. Like, March is uh, Driver Distracted Month. 
Distracted Driving Month in British Columbia. And um, last year, I, I wrote an article about uh, cell phone users and uh, wireless device users and automobiles. And, and of course, in my background is what I test for electromagnetic radiation uh, as part of my business. And I look at a lot of issues around how exposure to wireless radiation affects behavior and health and all that. And one of the things that keeps cropping up is that the radiation from devices like such as cell phones and texting and stuff, not only is it, is it a distraction to use those, those, that equipment, but in fact, the radiation itself impairs brain function. That our brains are electromagnetic devices and, and we work in very exquisite uh, balance with all, all the forces in nature and, uh, and we're immersing our brain in a very powerful electromagnetic radiation signals and basically it's scrambling our brains. Now um, I, I had Will, uh, Will's going to uh, put on a, a tiny URL on, for, this, uh, for this graph that I did last year in the article and if you go to powerofthepeople.ca and uh, hopefully we'll see that uh, URL and you'll see this uh, this graph on online but basically uh, what I was showing here was it was this one of the most powerful pieces of evidence I've ever seen to show that cell phone radiation addles the brain it just makes your brain work poorly and you can't drive a car as well and you have more car accidents in this table it's showing that after the phone is hung up at when you're driving in a car after you hang the phone up your chances of having an accident remain very high uh, for, for a half an hour after you've hung the phone up. And immediately after you've hung the phone up, in that first five minutes, you're four times as likely to have a car accident than if you didn't, weren't using a phone at all. And then after 10 minutes, you're about twice as likely and it diminishes that way. The thing to remember is that in, the, in this table is that nobody's using a cell phone while these car accidents are happening. Now, this is very powerful evidence to show that, that cell phones actually affect the uh, brain function in a very negative way. And uh, it's like one of these facts that it seems that our authorities just will not acknowledge, even the, though the yeah. evidence is so powerful. The authorities our, won't acknowledge it, and the media won't, won't put it out there. I mean, people should, should, people should know this. Yeah. So when we make decisions, we at least have the facts. I mean... We, we should all know these things and, and so many other things. Well, you know, I wrote this article and it's been published and, and you know, any, anybody can criticize it and it's up online and you can write your comment at the bottom of it. I'm waiting for somebody to say, no, you have this wrong. This isn't, isn't what happened. I, ch I checked this uh, very carefully with the author of a study that showed these uh, statistics uh, and was in communication with them and asking me, is this correct? Am I reading this right? And I was. They had no, they did not offer any explanation, the, the people that did the study, because that wasn't in the parameters of their study, uh, paid for my Motorola, and perhaps they don't want to say. But if there's a chance this is true, do you, this is profoundly important. And it's one of those cases where I'm sure a lot of people in their lives have found out other important facts about how something so, so important, perhaps it was with smoking or or uh, other health issues, uh, maybe with lead in, in, uh, in paint, and, and they were bringing it forward and the authorities refused to acknowledge it. This is another case where if you really did acknowledge the fact that your brain is being altered by that phone, that profound changes would have to happen within the regulatory agencies, and they just loathe to do it. Uh, I think it's the truth, and I think, uh, it behooves anyone that is con got concerns about this, it, particularly people that don't agree. If, if you don't agree with what I'm saying, I urge you to, to write me, come on, go online, say something about this article, show us what's wrong. Because if it's not wrong, then we have to take steps to protect people. Well, like, yeah, <laughs> but it, yeah. it doesn't happen, you know. How can, just in general, how can people protect themselves from the, <coughs> let's say you do use a cell phone and you have a, mo uh, a, a mobile phone in your home as well. Yeah. I know those, that's another thing that throws off a lot. How do you, should you be turning off your cell phone 
at night, if you have wireless in your home, like Wi-Fi, should you turn? Can you turn that off at night? Is oh, certainly you can do those things. Less expo exposure is always better. I mean, uh, you know, if you're talking to me and you're saying, "Doctor, uh, how many cigarettes can I smoke?" The doctor's always going to say, "You can't smoke any cigarettes." You know, but obviously less cigarettes are better than more. And the same thing with this type of radiation. But if you really look at that evidence and you really put it in the proper context, that my brain is really addled by this technology. And it's not just dexterity and attention that's addled, it's behavior. What about young children and teenagers? And all the other challenges that teenagers' brain is being put to with drugs and exposure to electronic media and all the video games and all this other stuff. And then on top of that, scramble their brains with some radiation on top of it. What sort of chances is that kid going to have to have a happy life or live a, a well-developed life? Much less. And, and I think parents should really think about this. This is not just some little thing that's sort of up in the air. These are profound physiological effects that have profound psychological effects that certainly are going to create havoc in our society, and I think they are doing already, and particularly with young people because of their, their physiology is much different than adults and their brains are, uh, their skulls are thinner so they absorb more radiation. We're heading into some pretty dangerous territory right now with this type of technology and our health authorities will not accept, will not admit that this is a health issue. This is why Norm Ryder's down on the legislature's legislature steps right now, trying to bring some sense to this, to this whole issue. Walt, we're going to have to let her go there. Okay, Jack. Always a pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, fundamentally important stuff, and uh, you know, I don't know why we can't do better. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for watching Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's uh, March fifteenth, twenty sixteen. I'd like to start by thanking uh, our volunteer crew and the Shaw staff that makes the program happen every week. Our guest in this segment is Dr. Peter Carter. Uh, we're going to be talking about climate change. So, Peter take it away. Hi Jack, thank you. Thank you for inviting me here. So in actual fact, um, many people may know that just over the past month um, there's been a lot of action on climate change, um, including action in Canada. So we've had the uh, Vancouver Agreement last week or something and that was the big meeting with big expectations. That was the Prime Minister and the Between premiers. our new Prime Minister, um, Justin Trudeau, and all the provincial premiers. Um, there was a great expectation, um, almost a promise in fact, that we would have some kind of a um, carbon charge on fossil fuel pollution, commonly called a carbon tax, but in actual fact it's a carbon charge for the highly damaging pollution even more damaging now under climate change of the fossil fuel industry. But as often happens, uh, or almost always happens with high level meetings and agreements on climate change, it was delayed. Uh, so that, that's really disappointing. Um, the media did pick up on one rather interesting story there. One good thing was that they invited a chief of the uh, First Nations people um, a chief from the Chasleta Nation, actually, who are suffering from the tar sands because they live downstream from the tar sands industry. And, uh, but the thing that caught the media quite reasonably was that he stormed out of the meeting. Now, that really is unusual. Um, First Nations leaders do not storm out of meetings. That really is not their way. Why? And, uh, well, he said it was very clear that nothing was going to happen. They were just going around in circles, and in particular, from his point of view, he said there was no uh, thought or sense of uh, protecting Mother Earth. Now, right now, with climate disruption, surface heating, ocean acidification, right now he's got one heck of a point, because Mother Earth is um, in very bad shape. And with uh, rapidly increasing fossil fuel pollution, um, it's getting worse. So uh, I, I, I would more than sympathize with him. I'd have to agree with him. I think he did the right thing. And clearly he did the right thing because nothing came out of the meeting. 
Yeah, and I have the feeling that, you know, when Trudeau was first elected, there was a lot of hope. He went to Paris and Canada was going to lead the way, 1.5 degrees. Um, but my impression over the last few months is that actually nothing is happening. Certainly no concrete steps that I can see are being taken by the federal government or the provincial government here to do anything to deal with climate change at all. Yep, undoubtedly and, true. It's a matter and, of life and death. You know, it's, it, it's, um, it's a matter of our future, you know, like a whole future of humanity and also most of life. I mean, we have unprecedented levels of uh, global temperature. The other two big stories on climate change was that in just the past year, the global surface temperature has jumped up more than it's ever jumped up before. In one month, you mean? Or uh, in months, one year. Month. Oh, yeah. In one year. And the other thing which took the scientists completely by surprise was that the atmospheric carbon dioxide which of course is the primary cause of heating and climate disruption, as well as the only cause of ocean acidification, that shot up in the past year. And um, a lot of the, um, I mean that climate scientists are um, overly conservative, let's put it like that, but they have really voiced alarm on this one. Um, it's um, it's and bad news, and so we have yeah. to have some real action, and the, the action is obvious, been obvious for decades, it's economic action. Um, you've got to pull the fossil fuel subsidies, right? It's absolutely ridiculous, fossil fuel industry still having huge subsidies when fossil fuel uh, atmospheric pollution is basically killing the planet and wrecking our future. Yeah, and I think you said it was in Canada, $34 billion. Yeah, yeah, it, Canada alone, um, I just checked the figures recently, and I was again shocked, last time I checked them, I, I was sort of shocked how big they are. It's 34 billion a year, that, that, that's, a, that's a huge amount of money. That's a massive amount of money. So it, in, uh, worldwide, it's over five trillion dollars a year. Now these numbers come out of the International Monetary Fund that have been doing really excellent work, the, the best work of anybody, uh, for about eight years now on the fossil fuel subsidy thing and calling for them to be terminated. However, the G8 have been promising that they're going to be terminated for 10 years now and we still have them and they're still sky high. Um, $5.4 trillion according to the IMF, that's by far the highest the fossil fuel subsidies have ever been. So the governments up. are taking our money to um, put a knife in our back, basically, and pay for our own funeral. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's completely insane. Absolutely insane. Um, the other thing, which, of course, everybody knows by now, really everybody knows, some people tend to forget about the subsidies, you know, but they're getting good publicity by the AMF and the World Bank and the International Energy Agency as well. But the thing that I think everybody knows is you've got to price carbon. I think, every, I think everybody's heard that, you know. Um, uh, uh, Pricing carbon means that the fossil fuel industries are going to be paying, they're going to be charged for mainly um, the impacts on our health as well as on our environment, uh, which is huge. The costs of damage to our population health, um, I, I was involved in this um, some many years ago, uh, it's, it, it, it's massive. The more we researched, the uh, um, health issues due to and linked to atmospheric pollution from uh, fossil fuel emissions, uh, the more we found, the more chronic diseases, you know, it wasn't just uh, asthma and chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and, um, uh, you know, sinus trouble and, and that sort of thing, which we'd sort of known for years, uh, more and more and more things began to surface from the research. So, um, Continuing with fossil fuels is, is really pretty crazy now. And, yet and we we're continue. stuck with them as long as the, government, the, the governments don't bring in these economic changes. So neither of those two things came out of the Vancouver uh, meeting. Not Nothing a, on subsidies. Right. Nothing carbon on carbon tax, tax delay. And that seemed, I guess that's the plan for Canada then, is there will do nothing. 
Yeah, um, the really shocking thing uh, well, is that although I got to give um, uh, Justin Trudeau and his new environment minister, uh, McKenna, um, full marks for their presence in uh, Paris at the Paris um, uh, United Nations meeting on climate yeah. change, which was another huge disappointment in actual fact. Um, but I've got to give them full marks for supporting, in actual fact, the majority of the nations under the UN Climate Convention negotiations, the majority of them, it, it's slim, but it is a majority, um, they have been asking for many years now uh, for under 1.5 degrees C. Now, everybody probably will have heard of 2 degrees C, so Canada did exactly the right thing to not support 2 degrees C, but support the 1.5 degrees C. But since then, as we've been discussing, nothing has happened in order to do that. So in other words, the 1.5 degree centigrade, uh, and remember, 2, 2 degrees centigrade temperature rise means essentially the end of our civilization as we know it, for sure. It, it does. And, it does. and we're, we're, we're on track for a lot more than two. Even 1.5 yeah. may be too much. Well, so, Jack, you're exactly right, because the... the and we're the, not even doing that. The really big thing that we've only just started to hear about um, through the media and the research is the impacts of climate change on our agriculture. Now, I've been working on this for quite a number of years because I'm a medical person and obviously, you know, if you're talking climate change, the first thing you want to look at is food security, you know, malnutrition, etc. cetera. And um, it's, uh, the research is uh, definitely alarming. We've known for many years that the most vulnerable region in the tropics and the subtropics, because it's already pretty hot there, um, with global warming, it's going to take minimal amounts of global warming to adversely affect their crops, and that's happening now. But some research which just came out um, two weeks ago confirms something that actually I presented at Potsdam a couple of years ago, which is that the global north is just as vulnerable in other ways to the multiple adverse effects of global warming and climate disruption. The a very worrying thing is the research showed, in fact, the adverse effects are slightly higher than the tropics and the subtropics, the global south, as people call it. Uh, the adverse effects are now slightly higher. And that includes Australia and, of course, the, you know, the northern grain belts, the great northern grain belts. So uh, our, our politicians really have to get up to speed with this one. Because the last thing a leader wants, uh, you know, I mean, they like to get away with various things, but um, they know that you can't get away with losing food security. So they have to be brought up to speed, and I'm sure that applies to uh, Premier Trudeau. Well, I think they know all this, and they don't seem to care. I mean, if you know it, and our viewers now know it, and I know it, they know it, and they don't care. So, uh, I mean, it, it's a little bit frustrating to watch our rulers, whoever they may be, uh, lead us to, to, towards disaster. Yeah, we, we, do, we sort of don't want to um, sort of admit that our leaders don't care. But look, we've been, the, the, the climate convention, which is the basis of all these negotiations which go on every year, which happen at Paris, that was 1992. It was ratified by all nations in 1993. It's a very strong convention. So from 1993 to 2015, nothing's happened except emissions have accelerated. That's the only thing that's happened. So well, you're right, you gotta think they don't care. Peter, we move on towards disaster. I hope uh, everybody at least can drive less. Thank you very much for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. This is segment three of Citizens Forum being filmed on Tuesday, March the 15th, 2016. Our guest in this segment is John Farquharson. We're going to be talking about sewage treatment here in Victoria. And uh, John, I mean, to me, the story of the last few weeks has been that we've actually had the chance, I think for the first time ever, of doing the right thing environmentally and possibly at a much, much lower cost than has been bandied about. 
So the, the story of the last few weeks has actually been one of something very positive maybe happening, although that story hasn't really been told to people of the city by the media. They're, they're pushing out other stories. <laughs> But you just said you were kind of delighted, which, which was well, nice Well, delight's maybe too strong a word, but I'm certainly encouraged in the sense of, uh, like you say, it's very fluid. The, uh, the, the big challenge that seems to be now beginning to um, disappear from the table is this notion we'll lose the money if we don't do something, make a decision by March 31st. Um, there seems to be in place a proposal that would uh, be uh, like a placeholder or an interim liquid waste management uh, plan. And uh, placeholder, <coughs> pardon me, apparently you need a place, a designated place, to hold on to the money. So you need a designated place. And up until the beginning of last week, the designated place was Rock Bay. Now that has changed to apparently Clover Point and McLaughlin and or Macaulay Point. And um, so that's encouraging. Um, and so if the respective governments, the provincial government and the federal government, are, are okay with that decision, the decision being that we've made a decision, it'll be these two sites unless we can find something better in the next six, eight months as we go out and really thoroughly canvas the, uh, the private sector. Now that sounds great. So it means that finally, after many, many years <laughs> of this going on... Decades. Yes, the, the, they're, we're actually going to go out and find out what is available on the market to do what it is that we want to do. We've never done that before, as crazy oh. as that sounds. Well, we haven't, we haven't. We've done it, but at a very, uh, at a distance. I think um, the CRD board chair, Barb Desjardins, described it as, we have had these uh, private sector vendors hovering have been hovering around this whole um, development. But uh, what she wants to do is to make, make sure they, they have an opportunity to land and to present what they have to offer, attach firm numbers to it, uh, uh, document the, you know, the environmental uh, benefits involved, um, and uh, again, provide details. The details have never been there before. They've always been very, very uh, large, conservative uh, numbers. Now, none of this ever happened. Instead, we came up with a plan several years ago, and it's only a plan that was going to cost us over a billion dollars to build a sewage treatment system that I think would give us zero environmental benefit and probably uh, environmental damage over what we do now. This was the secondary, yeah. centralized secondary at McLaughlin? Yeah. Okay. And luckily it was stopped. So now it seems like we're beginning to do what we should have done in the first place. And that's a wonderful and great thing. Yeah, what is in... And uh, hopefully one of them will work. Yes. I mean, again, if you bring in the private sector and, and allow them to, um, you know, again, make their case, bring you their proposals uh, in, a, in, a, in a thorough kind of way then uh, that's quite different than just <coughs> somebody ha <coughs> pardon me, handing you a brochure. So I want to ask you something because I went to a couple of meetings sponsored by the CRD on this sewage treatment subject about a month ago and I picked up uh, a small magazine that they were putting out and that magazine gave all the options that were available for me as a citizen to vote on. I could choose between those seven options and they were going to choose one of them. All of those options involved Rock Bay mm -hmm. and those were the only options on the table. And especially for what was going to happen on Cook Street with the necessity of putting a pipeline on Cook Street from Dallas Road up to Bay. Two pipelines. Two pipelines. One's going, one coming back. The, the impact on the people of that area of the city would have been massive as well as a 200 million dollar cost at least for building I mean this was a disaster and yet that's where we were just a couple of months ago well, now it's that's, not, it that's, seems, where, that's where we were two weeks ago yeah it hasn't been like two so weeks ago what that's happened we were. that what suddenly happened? stopped that crazy plan because last Wednesday I mean it's difficult to tell exactly what happened, but from you know out the outside looking in at the meeting last Wednesday, which would have been the ninth, 
um, call, you know, they were talking to the, uh, uh, the chair of the technical oversight panel. The technical oversight panel was charged with overseeing the work uh, by Urban Systems, and Urban Systems brought you those seven options that you referred to in the little, in the little booklet that you were supposed to choose from. And um, at the last minute, she was on conference call. Uh, Director Colin Plant from Saanich said, what about, what about Macaulay and Clover uh, Point? Would they be better options? And she said, better sites. And she said, yes, but we didn't know that they were on the table. So in that little exchange there, at the very last minute, Clover Point and Macaulay. So then what, what uh, Director Plant did is he you know, did an amendment to the amendment with respect to the motion on the, uh, on the table, and mag not so much magically, but very, very astutely, uh, got Macaulay and Clover Point onto the table. Rock Bay sort of got pushed aside, not off the table, but to one side. And so now you have Macaulay and, and uh, I'm sorry, you have Clover and uh, Point, and either McLaughlin or Macaulay back as the base case uh, sites. Now, for Clover Point, I understand it's going to be a, a, what, what they called a deep, deep, <coughs> deep site or something like that. Is, for the people in the neighborhood, would that involve drilling and huge amounts of noise or through rock, or do you know? I, d I don't know. I mean, obviously there'd be some disruption during the, during the construction of it. One of the um, uh, uh, requests by the city, or I guess not so much requests, but a demand by the city is that the uh, uh, residents uh, continue to have access to the, you know, the walkway that goes around Clover Point during construction. And um, there's, a, there's a, a thing called an amenities package and there's also a, uh, a hosting uh, that's given to the, to the uh, municipality that is hosting the facility. And I think it's to more or less recognize there'll be some disruption here and... Uh, but if there's going to be disruption, that <coughs> has to be taken into account too because yep. that, that's a negative mm -hmm. if, if people have to put up with... Yep. But we don't know at this point in time if there's... We don't, know, what, yeah. we don't know right now. Yeah. I wonder, I, I just, I, I continue to hope that... Um, uh, we end up with the best cost and especially the most environmentally effective system we can. Well, that was what came forth from the Integrated Resource Management Task Force. Again, at the very last minute, the Integrated Resource Management Task Force was going to report out on the 29th, and the, but the CRD Sewage Committee was going to make its decision on, December, on February 24th. Five days difference. So we, bes we besieged the, uh, uh, the Sewage Committee to, can you hold off for a few days? So they, they held did. off for three days, and the task force moved its uh, reporting out by two days. So they all came together on one day. And what they had to offer was, is encouraging. It's in very encouraging because of the substantial uh, financial and environmental uh, benefits uh, that could accrue, uh, including uh, greenhouse gas uh, mitigation. Okay, let's talk about the financial benefits because the, the old <coughs> plan, put forward by the CRD staff over a period of 40 years, let's say it was going to cost us a billion to build and another billion to run. So we're looking at spending $2 billion. What, what are some of these other numbers? Well, again, the emphasis now is, not, is on sewage treatment, but it's on a bigger picture now. Uh, sewage treatment and uh, resource recovery. And so once you begin to roll resource recovery into the picture, then you have an opportunity to recover some of the costs. Uh, in terms of revenue generated by extracting resources from the waste products. And so the Integrated Resource Management Task Force began to look at combining solid waste that go into Heartland with the biosolids that are left over after uh, the uh, wastewater is treated. Combining them, gasifying them, and extracting uh, this product called syngas, which can generate electricity. What's the environmental impact of gasification? Do you have any idea, or does anybody don't know? know? Um, uh, what have I heard? I've heard that they are operating in various sites around the world. The one that caught my attention, though, was they have them in California, and I know that California, because of Los Angeles and you know the amount of car traffic down there, they have very stringent you know emission standards. And so, if you've got a gasification that passes California standards for emissions, I think that's encouraging. Well, yeah, I, I mean, 
<laughs> to me, those are that's in, very important because I've heard you know you mentioned gasification and others, but I think we have to be sure that it's. Uh, well, the thing in terms of being sure, that's the that's the encouraging. Uh, window that's now open. We're going to, we're going to look at these things. Yes. That's the main thing, and thoroughly vet them to be you know to make sure. I mean, we should have been doing all of this ten years ago. We should have done this ten years ago, and it's it's really a disgrace that we didn't. Um, I don't know what the force was that stopped us from doing it because it made sense from day one to do it, but it never happened. Um, I, I think it's important that these things be investigated because if they're not investigated and people held It'll, accountable. Jack, this it will make, goes on and on and on. This will make one, for one heck of a case study. Yeah. Once it's all over and we've got something done in the next uh, few years, this will make a an incredible case study. Yeah. I want to see the movie. Yes, <laughs> see the movie. <laughs> John, thank you very much. My pleasure. For the, Thanks uh, for having for the me. update. So, there is hope. We've got to make sure that those hopes uh, are what go forward. We've got to do the right and smart thing. Thanks for watching this segment of Citizens Forum. Welcome back. It's uh, March 15th, 2016. Our guest in this segment is Paul Stein, and we're going to start off by talking about a new TV show. Or not, not so new, but it's going to be something. It's going to be coming up here pretty quickly. Okay. Um, it's funny how trends always happen late. You know, like when Facebook happened, when you, by the time you found out about Facebook, it was already like three years old, four years old. By the Much time you more. found out about YouTube, it was already like 10 years old. That's how trends happen, right? Um, we started Freedom Free For All, a TV show, oh, I don't know, maybe probably four or five years ago. And we'd just film local events, and we'd kind of go out there. You know, in fact, a big inspiration was you and Steve Poole, how you put Citizens Forum. Back, to, back in the d day, it was called yeah. Face, Face to Face. Face. Yeah. And, you know, I, I met you many years ago, and you talked about how you do this and how you should get it up on Shaw. You know, you're really ambitious about, you're an inspiration to me. And I thought, well, that'd be kind of cool. So found out what the parameters for Shaw was, what they needed. Uh, very Wayne's World style. It was just randomly done. We didn't know what we were doing. And slowly but surely, we got our feet wet, knees dirty, learned a little bit more, got into production. The team built. There's a pretty big team behind us that uh, like like on this set here what the viewer sees is just the two of us but there's actually probably 10 or 15 people that actually make this happen uh, so our team has been doing TV shows here for a while kind of sporadically on and off just throwing them in the hopper for Shaw local access television and now we've just signed a you know we've penned the ink so to say of a, of a deal for uh, to have our show aired on Shaw it's not filmed in this studio, it's back in our own studio, a garage, um, and it's going to be from basically April to June. So it's 12 weeks of our content, um, and what we do uh, for our show is that we live stream. It's a little bit different from this. Uh, we live stream live at 7.30 at night on Tuesday nights, and in the first half hour, we talk, we have like a new style content, and it's, it's freedom free for all, that's what it's called. So it's kind of beyond borders and we bring in ideas that we think are pertinent and prudent mm -hmm. to today's topics um, and then for the last half we bring in a guest into the studio very much like we're doing here uh, sometimes they're Skype guests from around the world so it's kind of like being local but being global at the same time and uh, so the last half of our show the roundtable segment which is a little bit more compact and polished and conditioned and censored uh, we can submit it to Shaw and Shaw will be playing it within their local access television just like you So I hope some of your viewers will watch our show give us our feet give us feedback And I think the most important thing that we have as humans is a voice So if you have a voice if your viewers have a voice they don't like what they see it's important to say it uh, If you like what you see it's important to acknowledge it. So that's where we're at. It's really exciting. There's uh, six guys of us that all do it. We're really excited. We're getting together after the show tonight to actually organize that 12 weeks and what it's about. Um, and a lot of the inspiration I say, Jack, comes from you. And, you know, um, I've said it before. I acknowledge <laughs> what you do, man. Like, new media, it's really important. It's really important to be the media, be the change you want to see. Uh, and not so much, I always say this, if you're not planning, then you're reacting. And you're a planner and you're making it happen. So many people react to the, to the whims of the world, you know, 
and uh, that's why they're always behind the times. So you bring on good content, you bring on good guests, valid uh, topics, it's local, and I think that's what we need to combat the corporate media, the corporate media that just in, in bombards our brains with what I call lies and fiction and deception, and uh, it distorts our realities, and then our realities become our, our, our perceptions become our realities. So that's kind of what we want to do, and it's, it's a, there's a hot topic to it. You know, freedom isn't free, it demands respect. So we try and bring that element to our show as well. But at the same time, sometimes it's important to speak your mind and say what you got to say um, with the purpose of getting feedback and allowing others to, to, to hear what you're saying and to have a voice back and comment. For example, we have a little live, during our live stream section, we've got a little section on YouTube where people watching our show live can actually comment. And those comments, uh, we speak to the guest. So it's not only bringing people from around the world onto the show, because we don't have the technology to have call-ins and phone lines and stuff like that. So we kind of bring in that context of outside questions into the studio for the guest to show. And we have a wide variety of, of guests that come on the show, and it's, it's really quite fun. When people, when people watch it, at least the part that's streamed, I mean, it's like watching CBC News or CTV News. It's very low budget. Very, very <laughs> low budget, but the effects that you can produce in your studio are yeah. out of this world. Yeah, and at the end of the day, I've got a, I kind of live by a motto, and it's don't worry, be crappy, just do it. Um, and just, just get it done, because so many people need to polish, and they wait, and they wait. And the window of opportunity is very limited with all ideas. And I, I believe it's not about being the best, it's about being the first. It's about going first to cause. So I see a need, which is media, which is communication, uh, non-corporate style, yes. almost reality TV, almost to the point that it's raw. I'm okay to make mistakes because that means I'm human. Whereas when you watch polished TV, there's no mistakes. It's to so polished, it almost looks fake. And so I kind of want to bring that back and show that these are real people talking about real topics and the beauty about change is that it's, it's constantly changing our opinion right now in this conversation the conversation we're having might help me understand what I'm saying could be false and I think that's an important process that humans need to hear I think that in this country one of the most important things we need is an alternative to the corporate owned media I mean I think most people don't realize and I say that because for the first part of my life I never realized and then even for the past 10 or 15 years as I've gotten more and more into it I mean at the beginning I was just skimming the surface and you realize toward later on how deep the media controls us in ways that I never suspected and the the tricks they use to manipulate us oh, it really is it's brilliant I mean you know, it's hard to explain. Words can't ex explain it. Yeah. But for example, what we're seeing with the Bernie and the Trump, the Bernie Sanders and the Trump, a lot of it is media, media manipulation to throw us to one side or the other, not looking at the truth, not looking at the balance of what's going on, to polarize us. That's what I was going to talk about tonight, was how the media polarizes our belief systems. They do. Meanwhile, what comes is, is in is the agenda. Yes. And the agenda always comes in. Yes. Yeah. Problem, reaction, solution. No one ever saw the solution coming, coming because we're so busy arguing about everything. Yes. The media pits us against each other. I think that's one of their most important jobs is to pit us against each other. And while we're fighting each other, as you say, they're right down the middle with the agenda. That's right. And, and I see that happening. And my prediction for that, the U.S., what I call the, uh, the U.S. circus or the election, uh, I think Hillary will probably come through and just steal the show because in my perception from looking at trends, um, it's been the Bush-Clinton dynasty for the past 20 years. And all of these agendas, 9-11 happened on their dime, they're all profiting from it. There's a lot of things going on behind the scenes. And the Sanders supporters will say, at least it wasn't Trump. And the Trump supporters will say, at least it wasn't Sanders. But meanwhile, no one will see what's going on, and that is there's an agenda beyond us. They've got, they've, it's a business plan, it's mapped out. And as long as we're not focusing on the synthesis, the middle point, we're too busy arguing back and forth. So that's kind of what Freedom Free For All talks about, is these kind of concepts, these ideas, and how we can be proactive, seeing trends, seeing things, and avoiding the same habitual patterns. Again, if you're not planning, 
you're reacting. And the world is constantly reacting. The newspaper's old news. We get it and we sit down with our coffee and we read it as if it's news. It's not, it's old news. It's yesterday's news. And not only is it, is it yesterday's news, but you know, on television and radio, which are giving us more today's news, it's only the news they ever want us to see yes. or hear. They can, it's the story they want to, I guess that's what I finally realized. It's just the story that they want to tell us. Yeah. Other points of view are simply not allowed. And it's very dangerous when a small group of, of people, because it's only a few corporations, control all, all the television, all the radio, virtually all the newspapers, the magazines, the books. They're big in movies and they're big in music as well. And it's all used to get their way. And we see how powerful they are. And I think, you know, well, you're talking about media. I don't think there's anywhere more important to be. Well, I think like what it is is it molds opinions. Yes. The media shapes and molds opinions, and, and and I've said it before that I don't believe people have opinions. I think we hold opinions, and then when there's a new opinion, we put that down and we grab the new opinion. And oh, there's a new opinion. I'll grab that new opinion, because they're constantly changing. Very few people have their own opinions from their own experience, um, and that's what I notice is that the media will manipulate our emotions, which creates our perceptions of reality. And then what we do actually creates the real reality around us. I always say take the 30-day no media diet. Like we talk about all these diets in the world. Well, we'll try actually turning your TV off for 30 days. Try eliminating all media bombardment into your brain for 30 days. Keep it between one and one face-to-face -face human contact. Read books and see, what, see how your mind changes. See how your thoughts change. Um, at the end of that 30 days. It's much like a workout or a, sh a shake juice mix that you take for 30 days. You're like, wow, I lost this much weight. And I look that, look at my skinny tummy, right? Well, I believe what you put in your body becomes you. What you eat is what you are. Well, what you think about and what you bring into your mind and allow to revolve in your mind, you go to bed thinking about it. And you wake up and you think about it. And then you live your life and you see things thinking about it. If you can't change the world, change the way you see the world. I think that's a powerful saying that I've applied and that's helped me create freedom free for all. That's helped me create something else rather than saying, oh, the damn media this, the damn media that, and always being behind and pointing the finger and blaming why I'm not successful in life. It's like, damn it, screw it. Eliminate all that noise and just do what I want to do. Focus on what you want, not what you don't want. And again, that's what I'm seeing with this whole Bernie and Trump is they're, they're arguing over what they don't want rather than focusing on what they do want. Yes. And that is And actually, control. Bernie and Trump are, but the media is reporting it differently. Paul, we're out of time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Freedom free for Thank all. Thank you. Uh, thanks for watching this week's Citizens Forum. Mm -hmm.